Now what do these two plastic cups and the rotor Aldo cranks both have in common? Let's talk about tapers. So hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. Now I'm soon to be testing out the Segei spider based power meter and to do that on my rim brake bike I need a new set of cranks because I want to do a direct swap with my 24mm axle Shimano cranks. And as you know at the moment Shimano cranks tend to be kind of splitting opinions. The Rotor Aldo crank is one of the only options out there if you want a direct 24mm replacement for a Shimano crank. Especially if you want a steel axle and you want to keep your Shimano, you know, in my case a PF86 bottom bracket. This is a straight swap because it comes as a modular kit um, and you can select either you know a BB30 axle or a 24mm steel axle. So I've gone for the 24mm axle, which is actually quite a hefty piece of engineering. It's pretty heavy, um, but it's really nicely machined. I have to say the quality is really, really good. And then I've got the matching 24mm interface cranks to go along with that. Now the cranks are CNC aluminium. I think it's all made in Spain and it has quite a unique design in the way it fits together. Now the good thing about the Aldus and the rotor cranks is they're modular, right? So you can take the crank arms and the axle is completely separate. So you can plug the axle into different crank arms, whether it be carbon or aluminium. But I think in the, in the 24 mil standard, I think the only crank arms you can use are the aluminium Aldus. On the drive side, you've got a spline to mount the chainring, chainring spider. Now you can use either obviously Rotor's own chainring spider, which is part of the modular kit, or you can use a power meter from someone like Segei or Power2 Max. Now, GP Lama's got a review of the Segei on his channel. I'm gonna review it separately and make my own thoughts about the power meter accuracy in a separate review, but that is not a tapered, um, tapered spline for that interface. That's just a sliding, it's quite a loose fit actually on that spline. There's very little backlash, but it's a really nice sliding fit. Then you've got a tapered spline interface where the crank mounts on. Why do I think this is an interesting design? Well, in mass production, and considering these parts aren't matched, so this axle is not matched to the cranks, you know, I should be able to take this axle and use it with any Aldo crank off the production line. The tapered spline thing, particularly on the drive side, is really hard to get right. Now the most common form of a taper that you probably haven't even noticed um, is just a couple of plastic cups or paper cups stacking on top of each other. After you provide them an assembly force and you put them together, they're then locked basically under friction. Now that is the simplest form of an engineering taper. You see them very commonly on drill chucks, on pillar drills, you see them in you know, milling machines. When you get the chuck and you just shove it up into the machine, you see them on lathe tail stocks, you see them on track rod ends on cars. If you ever worked on a car or, on a, or a lower control arm or a track rod end on a car, even after you take the nut off, the tapered coupling, you actually have to shock those things to get them apart because after you provide some assembly force, if you've got a very good mating conical taper to the part, they actually lock together under their own friction. And in a perfect world, you need the same force to disassemble the tapers as you did to put them together. They're great at mating two things together, but what is very hard to control is the final axial position of the two halves. Depending on the tolerance of the two mating halves, the angle and the diameters, you could end up with the tapers being locked there, or you could end up with them being locked there, or they could go a bit further in. And the, the taper angle, the finer it is, the higher the possible discrepancy on the final axial position. Where it becomes very vital is on the drive side of this one because you're trying to lock down the chainring spider and the power meter and also get a perfect mate at just the right time on the drive side spline. Why is that dif difficult to control? Well, let me show you a little experiment. If we call this the male taper and this the female taper, no sniggering please, I've pushed the two halves of the taper together, the male and female, and let's mark on the male how far it goes in. So that's what I'd call our final axial position at you know a nominal tolerance. Now let's see what happens if we increase the diameter of the male taper a little bit. Got some hot water, not boiling, just warm. All right, so we'll empty that water out and we'll put, reintroduce the two halves back together and we'll see what we get. Okay, that's locked. Let's make another mark on there. Right, 
and you can clearly see the slightly bigger male taper didn't go in as far as the slightly smaller male taper. Now, the tolerance of that, of that diameter, has to be so well controlled, and especially with these tapered splines, because these aren't you know straight conical tapers that you can turn nice and accurately on a lathe. This has to be CNC'd with quite a complex cutter. Now, the tolerance of that diameter and that profile has to be perfect, otherwise you're going to get a huge discrepancy. And that discrepancy there, I measure about two and a half, nearly three mil of, of final axial position. Now, if you had that on your spline here, you either wouldn't compress your chainring spider, so your chainring spider would be wobbling around, or you would go all the way in if the male taper was too small. You'd compress the chainring spider and lock that down nicely enough, but you wouldn't get a good mate on the rest of the taper and the crank would wobble. So the way they've achieved both at a set position, so you just get enough locking on the chainring spider and you get a really good mate all right around the taper, I have to say is pretty damn impressive. This is a very fine taper, maybe one and a half or one degree, something like that, it's very fine. The finer the taper, the higher the possibility of axial drift or axial discrepancy based upon the machining tolerances. Now, I'll take you through this with a bit of trig, but the driving equation behind the final axial position discrepancy is basically half the diameter tolerance divided by tan of the angle. So let's say you had a diameter tolerance on the drawing of the taper, a total diameter discrepancy of 0.05 millimeters. That's a typical machining tolerance, 50 microns. So that means if you had two male tapers, so two axles, and one was 50 microns bigger in you know, starting diameter than the other, the axial, final axial position of the same crank could be up to a millimeter further away. Now, if, it was, if this male taper was 50 microns too big, under the full bolt torque of the crank bolt, you, might, you may end up with a millimeter of space between the chainring spider and the crank. And that would never clamp down on the chainring spider. And that is the driving equation, and there's the proof. It's half the diameter tolerance divided by tan of the angle, which I approximate is 1.5. That's kind of a typical Morse angle, uh, Morse taper angle would give you almost a millimetre of axial position discrepancy. So it'll either end up too far out and never compress the chainring spider, or it'll go all the way in, but the tapers on the splines won't actually be mated. So it's just really impressive how they've done that. And I, before I got these cranks, I googled this issue, and, and I googled things like rotor aldo, chainring spider loose, or things like this to try and see if there are anywhere is like any production issues or QC issues with this kind of production method. Doesn't seem to be any issues out there, so I presume they've got it right. But we'll stick the chainring spider on. We'll do it up to 35 newton meters, and then we'll see what it looks like. This is very important because it not only does it dictate you know if those tapers are mating, it also dictates your chainring stiffness. And when the chain is running not perfectly straight or at an angle you want your chain rings to be mega stiff. And uh, the spider needs to have a very stiff interface as well because this is a power meter, this is a torque transducer. You want it to have a very reliable um, mating, mating interface with no hysteresis. Otherwise you're gonna get drift and hysteresis in your power meter readings because strain gauges which are inside here are very kind of sensitive to what we call end effects or how the thing is bolted or clamped at the boundary condition. So. It's very important that they got this right. Now the steel axles, I much prefer over aluminium axles because they're much harder, they wear much better. And obviously in the PF86BB, we've got plastic interface between the axle and the bearing anyway. Um, so that's why they don't wear so much. So that's 23.95, is that a G, a G series fit? Maybe an H? We'll check the Shimano ones and see what we get. Try another position. Try not to scratch my new axle too much. 23.96, it's pretty good. Drive side, 23.96. 23.96, so the roundness is really good as well.
So at 24 newton meters on the small torque wrench, there's still a discernible play in that chainring spider in the power meter. That's absolutely not good. I can't have the power meter kind of wobbling around all over the place, and that's going to give me absolutely pants chainring stiffness. So it just goes to show how important that 35 newton meter torque spec really is. So to get up to 35 newton meters, I'm actually going to have to put this in the bike to get enough purchase on it to react that 35 newton meters with a bigger torque wrench. And fingers crossed there'll be no play left in it. So I've just put it back in the bike, done up to 35 newton meters and just about got it there and there's no play in the chainring spider in the power meter. Thank God. And that just goes to show how kind of good they are with the tolerance on this on this taper because with such a fine taper, if that male taper was slightly too big, it doesn't matter how much torque you're going to put on that crank bolt you'll never get it to compress the chainring spider like I mentioned earlier so it just goes to show that rotor have really nailed the tolerance on this and have actually achieved something quite difficult to do in mass production and they must have a pretty good QC I mean they probably have quite high failure rate and rejects coming through the machining that would be my guess but it's quite ambitious to do this and they seem to have made it work now I probably would say it's not as stiff laterally as a normal bolted chainring set up with you know four or five bolts at a much larger PCD with a built-in spider because how much clamping am I actually getting on that chainring spider okay it's not moving it's not wobbling around but I guarantee it's not going to be as stiff laterally as a built-in spider with four bolts at a larger PCD just like a Shimano crank but you know I've taken it for one ride and you'll have to wait for the full review the ride review but I've taken it for one one ride so far I was cross-chaining, trying to get some kind of chain ring rub on the front met cage, and I didn't adjust the front met cage from the old chain rings the Shimano set up, and it was absolutely silent. I couldn't discern any flex. I mean, you can't really tell. You can't feel chain ring flex. Um, I mean, if you think you can, well, you're a wizard. I can't. Uh, I was just listening out for any chain ring rubbing. As the chain is cross-chaining, you'll get these lateral forces on the chain ring trying to pull it left and right. I couldn't discern any of that. It wasn't rubbing on the derailleur cage. So, so for all intents and purpose, well, it's fit for purpose, basically. So, yeah, pretty good. Stay tuned, and we'll do a much longer-term review. Cheers, and I'll see you in the next one.